Yeah, I know, it sounds like. Uh, so I think we're going to get started. Uh, so welcome, everyone. I'm going to do a few uh, welcomes and housekeeping, and then we'll start with our wonderful evening. Uh, so good evening. I'm Dr. Lori Dalton. I'm the board chair of the Nova Scotia Masterworks Awards Foundation and also the moderator for tonight's discussion. It's my pleasure uh, to welcome you to Masterworks' 10th annual Artist and Conversation. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are in Mi'kma'ki, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. This territory is covered by the treaties of peace and friendship, which Mi'kmaq, Maliseet, and Passamaquoddy people first signed with the British Crown in 1726. The treaties did not deal with surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Mi'kmaq and Maliseet title and established the rules for what was to be an ongoing relationship between nations. Masterworks, would like to thank the Music Room and their staff for all of their help with the evening tonight. We would also like to thank our generous award funders, Arts Nova Scotia and the Craig Foundation. The Masterworks Arts Award is facilitated by a volunteer board of directors and a part-time administrator who is lovely here today that we won't get to see, but she's the mastermind of tonight's, uh, tonight's event. Uh, I thank my colleagues on the board for their continued commitment to the mission of Masterworks and their devotion to Nova Scotians artists. This award was established in 2005. The Lieutenant Governor Nova Scotia Masterworks Arts Award recognizes excellence in all creative media and highlights works that have a strong connection to Nova Scotia in the context of national and international achievement. The Masterworks Arts Award is the largest cultural award based in Nova Scotia, with up to 37,000 awarded annually. Thanks to the all-encompassing scope of the award, Masterwork receives a wide range of nominations from every artistic medium. As you can imagine, evaluating such a diverse dossier of works is no small task. This year's peer jury has done an exceptional job of selecting four creations worthy of the title of master work. On behalf of the board, I thank the 2021 jury members for their hard work. We will be releasing the names of the 2021 peer jury members in early December. Now, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to the creators of these exceptional works and begin tonight's discussion. So how tonight's discussion uh, is going to work is I'm going to start off by asking a, a few general questions about the work, then we'll kind of delve down a little bit deeper into these wonderful masterworks this evening, uh, and then we'll have some time at the end for questions um, from the audience. Uh, and we're also hoping, again, this is very much a reciprocal kind of experience tonight, so we really encourage uh, hopefully lots of questions uh, and also discussions uh, amongst ourselves uh, as well. Uh, so I'm going to start off first by, uh, you know, an open question for each of the artists, and perhaps we'll just start to my left and go uh, around. Um, so I want, we're going to start first with the project um, of Andrew Steves um, and Alexander McLeod, um, Lagomorph. Uh, and I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what led the two of you to pursue this artistic project. Well, it's too bad that Andrew can't be here to speak about uh, the physical object of the of the book itself, which is my favorite part. Um, but we are old friends, Andrew and I, and uh, I've always admired his, his craft as a, as a kind of sculptor of a book. He makes um, objects of art, sculptures out of, out of, out of words, literally, uh, out of cast metal and paper and thread and cloth. And so when he, he, he asked me, we went for a walk one day and he said, I think we should do this, we should put this story, which is a story kind of about intimate connection. The story I think about the rabbit is a story about intimate connection. And he said, I think it can work uh, as, a, as a book. 
and, and the way you hold a book uh, was, was important to him. It always is important to him. He sees reading as a very physical, intimate uh, experience. So it was, it was a perfect fit, I think, between the material of the book, literarily speaking, and the material of the book, physically speaking. And so we managed to pull this off. Um, and I think sometimes books are seen as you know, a billion copies or as internet or reading them online. But that particular book, there, every single copy was touched by him and, and touched by me. And, and so I think it, it is, um, it's an intimate reading experience. And so I was, that, that's how it came about. Perfect. Thank you very much. So perhaps if we can continue around. So Neil, if you'd like to talk a little bit about your, you know, what led you to kind of pursue this, um, the artistic project of Poros? Um, well, the, the word poros is, um, and you say it very well, I might add, um, it's a Norwegian word and it just means porous, porosity. And um, when I was looking for a kind of next project to do, and at the time I was living in Oslo, Norway, um, I stumbled across the idea of, of really looking at a specific characteristic or quality of the medium in which I've immersed myself in for so long. I consider myself a, a ceramist, but th that is just one part of the arts. And uh, specifically, I looked at that material and I thought if I um, w was able to dissect a very particular part of, of or a particular create a particular question out of the medium, then that would lead towards something um, that would be less expected and, and out of the, um, uh, the kind of way in which I had been working. So uh, quite often, you know, you, we're looking for ways in which we can change or, or perceive again our medium and the way we're thinking about it. So the opportunity came to write a grant. So it, it, in some ways it started out as, as a question about uh, how I want to research a next project and there was support for that and that was by the Norwegian Artistic Research Council and I thank them for, for their support and their artistic jurying. And um, so once I had the question, which was, what is the problematics of a material that is porous? Okay, so that's a simple question. But it, it's a, a fundamental question about the medium. And I thought that th that question could be enlarged in so many ways. And I think for those of us who dedicate ourselves to very particular media, Sometimes there's even an anthropological kind of uh, 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 reservoir and resource that, that we tap into. And I would assume that to be true in many other arts, if not all the other arts. So I began to look at this particular question, but I had to kind of find a way in which to format it. And that was the interesting thing. You have maybe a research question, but beyond that, it's formless. It's, it's w without... Um, you know, without any interest, without any kind of meaning. And so for that, I started looking at some of the things that I was interested in, in particular um, architecture, and some of my um, friends who are architects are here this evening, and I relied on, uh, and, uh, on their knowledge and my interest in their field to ask this question of, of you know, how do you organize something? And something, in this case, it was very vague, but I began to look for an organizing principle and I came across the idea, and it was probably by my, my uh, friend Peter Henry who uh, uh, noted the word datum. And so th all that meant is essentially a kind of a floor. But in this case, it would be a floor that would be ramped. Now, datum is not exactly a floor. It, it, datum is is a way of kind of visualizing and understanding space. But I thought that was a good start because then I could pull in all sorts of things that you know, come from, oh, I don't know, ancient Greek uh, uh, understanding of space and all sorts of things. And then I just started to plug in a number of my interests and, um, and then narrowed that down and added some, some more things and they related to Greek pottery and colors that relate to Greek and Roman uh, kind of traditions in ceramics, and um, uh, fundamental kind of almost 
platonic shapes that I would use. And from there, I built in a number of other questions that, you know, I hope have some currency as they relate to the environment and, you know, and, and actually the field of natural science. And so those things began to kind of move into the mixture and uh, of what this um, project eventually became. Great. Thank you so much. So if we can go to the Princess Show team. Um, I'm wondering if you can, yeah, expand a little bit about what led you kind of collectively to create this project together. Can I take this one? That sounds, it, like, that sounds like a princess question. Okay. <laughs> um, so the three of us, um, as you noted, the three of us created this um, in back in 2016 when we were living together at the time. Um, in, in Lethbridge, Alberta uh, at the time. And for myself, it's kind of like the, the confluence of a couple of things that led to this. One being um, we, were, we had a venue together, venue still exists, a beautiful venue called at that time Club Didi. We did a lot of drag shows, we did a lot of cabarets. We also did straight theater and, uh, well really gay, straight yeah. theater. Traditional theater, uh, traditional, not, straight. not musicals. Um, we did a lot. We just—it it was a very community-driven, but also art-driven space where we sort of just allowed a lot of uh, expression around um, gender and sexuality. And this was the first time in my life that I had had that kind of outlet. I played in bands for most of my working adult life uh, for a living, and. Um, didn't really ever have that sort of expression of, of gender and sexuality. And that was happening at the same time through, I don't know, life, years of sort of probably not ex expressing gender and sexuality. Um, I, I, I was going through a very bad depression for the, I don't know, it was probably oncoming for three years before this project happened. And so uh, coming, going through that, and then sort of coming out the other side of it with a, a very different perspective on self-care and self-love. It was one of the first times in my life that I, I learned how to do that, to love myself, and to even love the, the, to even love the depression, I guess, in a way. That was sort of the fundamental twist that I realized, oh, maybe instead of hating that part, I can shift this into accepting it and loving it. Um, and all of us living together, uh, you two probably in some ways going through all that with me. Um, uh, in, in, the, in the great tradition of many artists, um, we just picked a date when the show would happen. Uh, it was in uh, several months in the future, and we said, we're going to do this show. And at the time, I knew I wanted it to have drag numbers. It was going to be like based on some cabaret numbers that we had done before. Um, Abel is... My co, uh, this is Richie, he's not able, but in the show he's able. Um, it was going to be sort of this sort of cabaret show, um, but we just, I don't know, started throwing ourselves into it. A narrative was starting to emerge around this sort of thing about self love and self acceptance. Um, and I knew I had this idea where I, what I could do is put a, a projection scrim across the background, and we would do all the backgrounds digitally. And we were sort of obsessed with anime cartoons at the Very time. Very obsessed with anime <laughs> cartoons at the time, uh, spending a lot of time watching them, and wanted to put it on stage. Yeah, we just thought that would be a, a great sort of feeling medium. And you could do anything as long as you could digitally design it. Um, and uh, it became a very collaborative process about just, <laughs> we, we talked about it like if you just threw an idea in the wall and it stuck, it would just go for it. If it made you giddy or laugh or feel great, it, it's, it's good. We should go with it. Um, so a lot of things came together that way. Diani uh, brought in claymation to the fold as well as an outside eye. We were both on stage. Um, and yeah, that was basically how, how this all came together. In the end, uh, although we planned the show in a couple of months, we had other shows leading up to that. And the first draft of the show, we made it in a very interestingly intense two weeks. Um, but then continue to develop the show after that first. But that first presentation is sort of where, yeah, where it came from. Great. Thank you.
Uh, so John, I'm wondering if you'd like to take up the, that question is, you know, what led you to this particular artistic project and, and some of the inspiration that led you to this project? Sirens in the Ulysses. I, I found that still find it very interesting because it's uh, kind of a metaphor of desire where you go out into the world and there's dangers in the world of being seduced by one thing or another. Uh, and I find it fascinating that the word siren comes down to us in like if an ambulance comes by, there's a, there's a siren. The name goes back to the sirens from Ulysses. And so, uh, so the way language collapses time, I was interested in visually collapsing the time. So these are based on four, four I that exist. Uh, I, re I mirrored the front so they're both coming or going, so you can perceive them that way. And they're the cardinal positions within the city of Halifax. They're placed that way. Each base is five tons of black African granite. And geologically, Nova Scotia is half Africa as a continent in the, in the creation geologically. Uh, so I was trying to, I try and live in the now. So I, I, you know, why, why would you go back to historical artifact and bring it into the now? Uh, and it poses the question, why here and why now? And I think that's a, a, a question that one can uh, approach anything with, with, with that question. Um, so, I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, John, I'd like to um, talk a little bit more. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the sirens calling. Uh, and so just a note for those um, in the audience, uh, there is a, a program, so you can kind of have um, add additional descriptions on the work. Uh, we weren't able to get uh, a big screen because we have filled the stage with our lovely artists um, this evening. But for those also live streaming, you can also visit the Masterworks website that also has images um, of, of all the projects that we're talking about uh, tonight as well. Um, so John, in your project Sirens Calling, you're talking about how you know, it's based on these four um, archaic Greek figures. Um, so an archaic Greek figure, so a traditional kind of representation of the body, right, is kind of right. what, you're, what you're drawing upon um, in this project you know, and then in four cardinal points um, in the city. So I want to kind of talk a little bit about what your nominator, um, David Divini, kind of put um, in your application. And so um, David notes, uh, quote, Greer's adoption of the traditional forms of sculpture, the statue, the relief, the monument, the architectural construct is readily apparent in the siren's calling. This delicate balance, the merging of old and new tradition and innovation Image and object further highlights the uniqueness of Greer's approach to sculpture in Siren's Calling. So kind of picking up um, on what you just said and what, um, what your nominator noted, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about, you know, the way you like to work with traditional forms, but particularly in Siren's Calling, you're noting that from the back, it really reads as very much kind of a classical work, but on the front there's a reflective element in your use of some of the mirroring, but also use of some of the steel in it. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit more about, yeah, your interest in the past and the present, um, but also your materials um, that you've used the, in it. Yeah, the materials are cast stainless. Uh, it is difficult to find places that cast stainless steel. And the, the, the mirror surface is welded on, and it, uh, that's very difficult as well, to, to not have a warp in the front of it when you're welding it on. So they're cast in upstate New York. At, at a foundry there. Uh, <clears throat> I picked them, frontality of sculpture is, is a big issue within the discourse of sculpture. And partly that comes from the aristocratic relationship with sculpture in Paris, in France. Well, that's why in the, you go in the Louvre and the figures are against the wall because it was embarrassing for an aristocrat to walk behind another person. So the sculpture became a surrogate for a person. 
I find that interesting. Uh, so I kind of turn the backs into the fronts in a way. Uh, and they're high enough that in mirrors are often confused with vanity because that's how we usually use them. Like Cocteau said, the problem with a mirror is that it doesn't reflect before it throws back an image. Uh, and, but what it does, it allows you to get a distance on yourself. And so by having these six feet in the air, they're above whoever walks through there. So it's not about seeing yourself in it, but reflecting where you stand at the present moment in the larger world. Great. And, it, and uh, the, I chose the figures based on, uh, like North, there they're, looks like uh, she's wearing heavy clothing. Mm -hmm. South looks like her hair is made of alligator skin. Uh, and so the setting sun in the west and the rising sun in the east. And so these are, uh, I used hairstyles and clothing to indicate the uh, cardinal points. Great, thank you very much. Um, so we're gonna move on uh, to the Princess Show Collective. Uh, and I have a question uh, kind of about uh, your use of lip syncing, but I kind of want to talk a little bit about um, the project um, first. So your project is described as a gender-bending theatrical work in a form that is equal parts stage play, drag show, and anime cartoon. Uh, it involves two live actors to tell the story of Princess Edward and her beloved Abel in their quest to surmount depression and shame in a dystopian fantasy world. So your nominator for this piece was Karen Gross, and they note, quote, creating a unique art form that blends drag performance and anime aesthetics, the Princess Show introduces its audience to profoundly and beautifully queer worlds. It is a transformative audience experience that evokes deep joy, uh, end quote. So the first question I have um, is kind of about the use of lip syncing. That's drawing on a lot of kind of traditions, right? Um, of, uh, of drag kind of performance, which you've talked about, but you've also talked a little bit about um, uh, the kind of obsession with, with watching anime and the experience of watching kind of dubbed over, right? Anime or dubbed over foreign films. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, your use of lip sync um, as kind of a device um, in this performance and kind of wh why that approach a little bit. Yeah, I think I can take a little bit of this one. Uh, we had recently been in Dublin for a theater show that we were doing with Theater Outre, and uh, we went to a drag show as we normally would do anywhere we went. And, uh, and these two queens were, um, these two performers were lip syncing like uh, Irish soap operas. Uh, and it was so fascinating to us and, and really memorable. Uh, and we kind of went home talking about it a lot. And I remember uh, Aaron saying, we have to just, start doing like lip syncing dialogue uh, and and then it kind of went off on that and with the anime uh, the same thing where we were really fascinated with them um, with that genre and of course yeah we were watching it dubbed and and we kind of loved the uh, the effect of that and uh, th how emotions were kind of stilted uh, because of that uh, effect um, and so then we just jumped into it uh, and the challenge of that, uh, of lip syncing a whole entire uh, show, so all of the dialogue, all the breaths, um, everything, uh, it was very, it was a very different rehearsal process because uh, you were then like, we had to do all of the sound design before we even started the show, uh, before we started to rehearse on stage uh, and that we were recording our sound cues and then, you know, I'm listening to them in an earbud uh, and trying to get the exact laugh or the stutter that I did during that sound cue, I was like, why did I speak like that? Uh, but then that was actually the most fun lines to lip sync because they're the most challenging. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and so really I think it was kind of from Dublin onwards, we decided we were doing it like that. Yeah, and the, the sound design element too, starting with the sound design, you know, when you're trying to recreate the feeling of a cartoon, cartoons often it's the sound that comes first. Um, and so getting it very interesting to get your vocal performance all first in a studio. Um, and kind of the writing was somewhere between writing it out and just hitting record and starting it. And I'm a sound designer by trade, really. 
So for me, I, I could envision the scenes and score them first, which was like, that's a dream. <laughs> I don't have to wait for everybody to learn their lines. Um, and yeah, so, and I mean, and working at Didi at the club with Theater Utrecht, the, the drag aesthetic was something that was big in our lives then. It, it was a common thing. If anybody hasn't been to a drag show before, Often you'll, you'll go and see fabulously dressed humans who host a show and then lip sync pop songs. Uh, or not necessarily pop songs, but often they're lip sync performances. And um, yeah, this, this challenge of being able to tell a whole story, you know, lip synced. Um, it's great too, if you forget your lines, it doesn't matter. Hmm. <laughs> this, uh, actually, can we give a trick about the lip syncing? Uh, that when... Uh, when you might be unsure about your line uh, or how it starts, uh, really all you have to do is make sure that your mouth is open uh, so that you're like, and then you can pick it up. Because ah, uh, okay. if it's closed, people will notice <laughs> that, oh, they didn't know their line. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the tip for lip syncing. The lip syncing also made for a really interesting experience um, from the audience's perspective, mm -hmm. um, especially because when we first performed this show, we were doing it for an audience that knew these characters very well. Um, because these the characters of Princess and Abel had already existed in our world of drag in the city. Um, and so to have the voices that they're lip syncing to be a voice that you know that should be coming out of this human's mouth, but it's coming out over here, made for a really interesting experience for the audience where they really um, became immersed in the character. Like you weren't watching a performance you were literally inside Princess's head or you were inside Abel's head in those moments because the sound of their voice wasn't coming from in front of you but from all around you. Great, thank you very much. And now I wanna try out that lip syncing trick. <laughs> I'll keep you posted. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Neil, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, Poros. Uh, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about you know, what the project is a little bit for people that aren't um, as familiar or had the lovely pleasure of getting to see it because probably not too many um, in Nova Scotia because of its, uh, uh, its exhibition history. Um, so Poros is very much envisioned as a modern grotto, a sanctuary invoking our biosphere as theater of improv improvised events and natural processes. Forest follows the tradition of grottos as an artistic expression where the viewer experiences the hiss of water escaping through tiny pores in the clay, crystals teeming around rods and inside bells, and the hollow sound of water dripping. So one of the questions that I want to ask you um, kind of stems from some of uh, your nominator's comments, who is Peter um, Henry, and he talks about showing the kind of the mechanical kind of also nature um, of the project. So I just want to read something um, that he wrote. Um, so he quotes, quote, on full display is the plumbing and mechanics of this pseudo environment, water pumps, hoses, valves, compressor, electrical cords and carpentry. Nothing is hidden, although nothing is certain, end quote. So I'm wondering if you can kind of expand a little bit on that, you know, that materiality, particularly of this project of exposing that kind of underlay um, of the mechanics and of the experience. Um, yeah, I think we're living in a period where um, parking everything behind closed doors is um, is the less interesting um, a k kind of way of of looking at um, a, a, a problem, a project, um, an art form. In fact, so um, perhaps it's some it, it's an idea that I board. A, a, something from architecture. Um, if you look at some of the more um, revolutionary buildings, um, uh, many would know some of the buildings in the, um, I believe, 1970s or 80s, um, in particular, the Pompidou Center, and uh, where we see the, uh, the, the, the kind of guts, the viscera of the building is actually appears on the outside. Now, maybe it only happens once, and it happened on that particular building. Um, but I think we all live with it. We're, look, we're in a building right now where we're seeing the mechanics of the building. So uh, hiding those things didn't seem to be um, a necessary thing uh, for me. Uh, I put a very uh, loud compressor um, off stage, but um, really there was a stage and there was a lot of objects on it. And um, seeing it as a grotto was also, I was also making this sort of connection to um, uh, basements and 
trenches and these things that are typically um, the last places that we want to go. And, you know, these, these are the, the sort of psychic spaces uh, or, or the spaces that we have a phobia for even. And um, so I came t to face the problem of, well, how do you create that without, in fact, building a room? How do you kind of invoke this idea of, of something beneath you um, maybe something kind of uh, partially hidden and partially exposed. So um, the, the, the ramp or the datum has a, um, um, a, a walkable surface on it and, and it's, it's a, um, a, a metal grid so that you can actually peer through it. So you can see some of the workings. Some of those workings appear to the side of the, the if, if I was to call it a stage or, or a walkway. And, and so you see these things kind of sliding underneath but, but moving away from it. So all the apparatus are, are located in a way that you can kind of find them. So you're not trying to, to mystify anything in terms of the production of it. And moreover, it's the sort of confluence of something, of, of a, a natural system that's been synthesized somehow and it's been put into this form where uh, there's clay discs and and cisterns and in particular I, I really wanted to, to use the, the idea of a cistern as opposed to let's say a pot which most people associate with ceramics as pottery but I thought about cisterns as the important way to go because cisterns are in the public realm not in the private realm. That's pottery often serves that role and that's where it's it's found and of course it's it's functions that it functions that way. But when we think of water that that is in in an urban or civic setting, that is in it, at least in the historic past, and John's talked about collapsing history into the present, um, we, we shouldn't forget about history and I think he made a great case for why not to. Um, because those things, you know, they, they remain viable metaphors, they, but they also r remain as things that we should never forget about. And, and I think often we return to those, uh, those ways of doing things. So I wanted cisterns because they were the kind of public presence of, of ceramics. And maybe not the ones that we're most used to, but um, nonetheless, you go to a farm, you'll find a trough for the sows or the chickens or whatever, so that is a cistern. Moreover, I'd been to um, Istanbul a couple of times and the most remarkable thing there, at, well not the most remarkable thing, but one of the remarkable things um, was the Roman cistern that's, that's underneath the, the, the city and still preserved and probably still respected by all those who would know of it and probably many of the denizens would know that. And here is this cavern below street level. It's a room. It's kind of formless because it's dark. It has all these columns and, and there's faces on them and uh, it, some of them are columns that are crushing, the, you know, the, these portrait heads, you know, that are at the, at the base of them. And and it's this watery environment, and yet it's 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 the a life supply in the city. So I wanted water to be a kind of narrative feature of what I was doing, and it, you know it is a life uh, feature. Um, it, it is it is that, and but it's also a problem. It, you know, water. We try and keep it out of our houses. We waterproof everything. We probably have boots that are waterproof at the ready in Halifax. And so it's both, water is the thing that provides life and yet we want to keep it where, in the right places. And so I thought about this sort of water as a narrative element, where would it be, where would it be in ceramics? And so, um, and moreover, all these natural materials, and we see uh, we, we see the wall doing the thing that I forced my, my work to do, which is efflorescence. So these 
natural things that are often problematic are, are going to appear and we're going to have to live with them or combat them. And so I was trying to invite them into the process and therefore I decided to grow crystals on some of the work and you know, instead of glazing work, although I, some of that happened in it, I thought I would grow the color on some of the work. And so I cu cultivated crystals, crystals that had colors. And that's efflorescence. That's, you know, if we found it in our house, we call it scumming. Um, mm. Or in our sinks, and we would rub it away. Uh, this I wanted to, uh, you know, invite into it. Now, I did it in a very polite way. I, Admittedly, <laughs> um, but um, uh, and and maybe I w would learn to do it differently the the, the next time. But uh, these were uncontrollable parts, and I uh, that was also it's also an interesting thing in, in when we're doing a project. And I think everyone on the uh, you know in this uh, semicircle are, is are thinking about these things that change not because we. Um, d decide that they're going to be part of it, but they're aligned in such a way that that a particular mind may or may not make a connection uh, to those things. I would connect to it, and uh, and uh, Alexander might not, but another connection will be made <laughs> by my neighbor, um, and uh, uh, and something else. A, a new d d d and different story or thread will be developed because of his, you know, biology and place in the world. I wouldn't count on me too much. <laughs> <laughs> I miss a lot of stuff. <laughs> um, I think we should count on you. Okay, good. <laughs> because you have the mic next. Um, but um, uh, so these were some of the, the things that, that I wanted to, to connect into it. And so in some ways, I realized at the end of it, it, it was sort of like a, a kind of a science experiment, you know, and I gussied it up uh, and I, I organized it by all the means that my kinship and f friends with those who bring other kinds of ideas, you know, help bring other ideas to, to in, into my um, domain um, and started to try and find a place for what I would do with you know these you know kind of particular shapes on you know and try and create this essence of grotto and I'll just say one other thing is that living in Norway was uh, quite remarkable because I, well I was living in the in the the land of my, one of my favorite authors, Knut Hampson, and I, I'm reading Karl Ova Knosgaard right now, and, and he's reviewing his, the, the history of his people and, and the, uh, some of the, the things that they did that created a, a kind of huge problem for their society, which is to say, uh, some people aligned with Hitler. And I started, I, I'm in this environment where people in my generation uh, in, in Norway, in some of them are still, you know, dealing with this sort of legacy and problem. And so I thought if I could come up with a grotto, a trench, a basement, that it also suited the, 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 the kinds of things that I was discovering by being in another um, in another society and culture, and I wouldn't have known that, but for you know reading these remarkable authors and knowing a little bit of, I suppose, of you know the the, the, the history of of the 20th century world wars. But it was really those authors that that brought the psychological problems that that still persist um, to this to this very day, and, and I was looking to do that in some ways in a kind of a very quiet, abstract, more abstracted way rather than a literal way. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so I wanted um, Alexander to talk to you about the project um, Lagomorph, uh, and Andrew, if he's watching, hello Andrew uh, as well, uh, who's uh, one of the other um, collaborators uh, in this project. He has a cold. Uh, so, uh, Lagomorph uh, is a short story um, written by Alexander McLeod about the relationship between a man and the family pet, a rabbit named Gunther. It was first published in 2017 by the online journal Granta. 
Um, the project that's been nominated uh, and was one of the finalists for a masterwork is a project between Alexander McLeod and Andrew Steves. In 2020, um, with Gasparo Press, they published a book version um, of this project in an exquisite hand-printed, hand-stitched, and hand-bound letterpress book and an edition of 80, um, which Alexander's talked a little bit about um, when we started today. So I want to talk uh, a little bit based on some of the comments, again, that your nominator um, submitted. In this case, um, the nominator is Marilyn Smulders. And she notes that original, in perspective and focus, McLeod's, McLeod's story employs a rabbit to observe the disintegration of a marriage. Gunther is an extraordinarily long-lived rabbit and seems to take everything in. The three kids, the soccer games, the piano, the swimming lessons, the minivan, constantly idling in the driveway. So the question I have for you is, uh, you know, the rabbit kind of forms this almost a witness to this disintegration that happens. Um, and sitting often through these perhaps somewhat mundane moments, sometimes our most mundane moments can perhaps be the most powerful, a soccer game, a swimming lesson. So I'm just wondering if you can expand a little bit on, you know, the, the choice of this rabbit as the observer um, of these moments uh, that happen through the story you've written. Okay, um, so... Uh, rabbits are uh, the world's great listeners, but not the world's great speakers. Uh, <laughs> That's good. I have more. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> what I was interested in was a rabbit's two, two great skills, sort of supernatural capacity to witness, and then the speed of their generational uh, reproduction. So I was interested in that my rabbit would, in real life, rabbits only live in the real world. A rabbit lives for two years. But in this family, a rabbit would live for 15 years. And the idea that that is not natural that is not natural. And I was interested in the, in the denaturalization of love, the denaturalization of intimacy, and the way that um, we all witness in this way. So, um, um, and the, I think to just bring what Andrew does into this, what's interesting, what's interesting about his books is that they defamiliarize what you think you're familiar with. So you think you know what you're getting into when you pick this up, but then when you pick it up, you're like, whoa, this is not what I, this is not like other books I have ever picked up. And what I was interested in doing with the, with the rabbit was, um, this is different than you thought it was. Uh, and you have made some assumptions here that perhaps you should not have made, and, and this is the nature of intimacy all the time as well. I, th I think there's a key part of intimacy that's communication. And so in the opening passages of this um, story, the, the guy is looking at the rabbit and he is literally thinking like, what do you think? Uh, and, and we all have this, some of you have. I assume that somebody out there lives with an animal. Do you? Oh. I, I speak to you. We shall, we have lots. Let's just stop the masterworks and uh, get into the rabbit chat. Uh, but, uh, but, but the idea is that, that people think they're having more intense relationships with animals than they're having with people. And I think that has an, not, an awful lot to do with the problem, the philosophical problem that is language. And so the story is very much interested in language as well as a communicative challenge. Great. Thank you. Uh, so I have a few more questions, but I'm also, you know, mindful of our lovely audience uh, that's here. Is there anyone in the audience that has any questions of any of the any of the creators? I have a question. Yes. Part of that, in my mind, is also a lot to do with 
light and smell. And I wonder how you deal with those mediums in your work, because water was a really interesting kind of clear component. But you know, when you're talking about the kind of Istanbul spaces or um, these kind of savings, that, that just sort of also evokes in my mind as well the, the other phenomena. I th that oh, th just really briefly, sorry, just for those live streaming because they yes. um, might not have heard fully the question. Yes. Uh, so it's really a question, uh, ex if you can expand more about, uh, you know, the light and kind of the smell, right, of those spaces because you were talking about cisterns and those kinds of environments. So uh, yeah, that's a, how, you deal with that. how, how you deal with that uh, in your work, just for those live streaming because they might not have heard um, the question. So if you could expand on that really thoughtful question would be really wonderful. Um, yeah, those, some of these things I, I learned during the process and some I've learned s since and, and living with it because uh, you mentioned, or I mentioned, but maybe you were reinforcing the question of uh, you know, being underground and cistern and the idea of, of grottos. I, I think everyone would have, uh, immediately kind of feel coolness or and dampness and how that kind of penetrates our through our, our clothes and and we're reacting in a very bodily way um, I started to think that they that it could I could create a kind of micro environments um, and that these part of what I did was I drove high pressure air and, um, and a lesser amount of water um, into these kind of internal distribution networks inside these objects. Um, this is really quite far from rabbits, um, but we'll... <laughs> it all comes back to It'll all come back to rabbits, I'm sure. I'm sure rabbits are going to win out here. Um, uh, the the p pushing this out, kind of squeezing all this through the pores of this kind of synthetic rock, because it's kind of what I was thinking about. I had driven through uh, rock faces, and we do so in Nova Scotia kind of every day of the week, and, we, and you see the, these rocks essentially you know, kind of bleeding. You know, there's always one material moving through another, and I started thinking about the different states of, you know, of, of matter. Um, and so I got, uh, what, what started to happen in the piece, which was perhaps the, the, the most successful part of creating this, the more full environment, I think, that maybe your question gets to um, or suggests to me, is that you can start to hear things as the, as the compressor drove air through it. I, you know, I didn't really predict what, that it was going to be noisy, but in fact, you know, even the mechanic mechanics aside, there was this hissing, the, the, the sounds and water dripping that I wasn't expecting to be dripping, um, and and a kind of hollowness started because of this, you know, one cistern or this one big clay pot and the water dripping into the bottom, and then. Uh, I was draining the water out and recycling it, and then there would be an electric pump that would kind of drive things, and that was all in earshot. So you would hear this sort of set of sounds, both mechanical and kind of natural, and it was really the natural sounds that I think delivered more this idea of, of, of the grotto. And the grotto is a kind of, in some ways, it's a romantic space in, in literature, um, in you know, those who would be, make it architecture from the landscape. And we, there's, we, there's a history of that in, especially in England with some of the great um, landscape architects, I assume Capability Brown had some kind of grotto on some project that he worked on in the 18th century. Um, and so I was hoping to kind of be able to invoke those things. Um, the other thing, and, and this is something I learned very um, a, a long while ago from, from Peter Henry, my nominator, who was an architect, um, is, is that if you don't have, if you can't actually make that space, you have to, to, to kind of frame it in a certain way. So 
uh, and that's just the same way that this space is being framed it, by lighting. And so it was really withdrawing most of the lights that were in the gallery. And that was a trick, is to figure out how to put the minimum amount of light on something. And some, some things need the maximum amount of light. They want to be in the daylight. This needed to be in the twilight, in the night. That's Basements don't exist in the daytime. There's something else. They're just another room. But there's all these things we associate with moving to other levels, you know, uh, moving into a cave or something. So, uh, you know, I felt that one of the few ways that I could deal with it, I, I, you, you could look through a grate, uh, and so that was one way of doing it, that was suggesting it, and I cut holes in the grates and actually dropped all the objects, These and they're all clay, mostly ceramic fired clay objects, and and I kind of set them down almost as though they are sinking, and uh, you know, and we're they're disappearing into this other kind of place, and so those were all just little suggestions that I was trying to make and trying to keep everything low. Everything was below knee level, and that was an interesting kind of problem for me is that. Um, uh, there are uh, some things should be, need to sit proud and tall. John's piece, the sir sirens, must do that. But not, maybe everything has to do that. And um, so it, I was just kind of collecting a, a bunch of objects that did different things. I felt I, felt I had some categories of things. Um, some that moved water, some that, that grew crystals, some that actually that had images or representations of the place that I made it in, these Norwegian buildings that I put like ships in a bottle and uh, you know all these little things that uh, I don't know, folk artists would do. And I decided to do them and collect them together. So you know I collected them all in this one space and everything really happened sort of uh, at waist level or below. And rabbits do well in that, <laughs> in that dimension as well. Great. And thank you for the wonderful uh, question. Uh, I want to circle back to the, uh, the Princess Show. Uh, and you were talking a little bit in the beginning about some of your inspiration uh, that led to this project. And um, you know, in, in reading about your project, so I haven't seen it, but in reading about your project, I'm sad that I did not get to experience it, perhaps, but perhaps in its virtual form one day, or if I practice my lip syncing. <laughs> or, or we just uh, do a remount. Yeah, that would, uh, <laughs> maybe that would be great. Yeah, we have done a number of times. It might come back. Oh, okay. Um, so, but much of the production, for me, and, and the way, you know, I, the way I felt about it was really about creating space. Um, the space of the environment that the princess explores in terms of the narration, the space of the audience in terms of how they experience, you know, the different um, visual elements, um, but also the space ultimately for queer storytelling. And how do you find that the particular medium um, in, this, in this kind of amalgamation of a kind of performance um, allowed you to explore the concepts of identity, of queerness, and of multivocal approaches. Like, how do you find your, the, the approach really helped you to explore um, queer storytelling in this particular way? In the claymation, all the, all, all the visuals as well. I think because we didn't limit ourselves to being in the box of a stage play, and we literally just let our imaginations run free and didn't ever cap each other and be like, no, that's not, let's not explore that. Um, that it gave us the opportunity to really explore all of those different things and to pull in things that you wouldn't be able to necessarily do um, in the way that this digital world moved around and moved with Aaron and the, and the way that mm -hmm. Princess would like turn and the whole, that's not something that you could recreate um, physically in, on a stage in the same way that we were able to do that by interacting digitally. Um, but it also gave us the opportunity to, to do things like the stop motion animation, claymation that was in the show. Um, we also incorporated sign language into some of the lip syncs that were happening on the screens behind us um, that then became a part of the choreography. Um, 
yeah, it just really gave us a chance to um, be more expansive and more expressive and not limit ourselves at all. I don't think, other than the pizza box <laughs> monster, so that which was the original that idea <laughs> for the beast, I don't think there was anything that we ever said no to. We always just said, let's make it work, let's find a way. Yeah, yeah I think one of the big things around that as well is the um, amount of queer family uh, and collaborators that we had within the, the process of this uh, that we're hearing so many voices through that because we did welcome so many people. Yes, w we are the lead creators, but there's a lot of uh, people that uh, helped out throughout the, the iterations of this show. And uh, as it kept going, the queer family kept uh, growing more and more. And, uh, and I think that that allows all identities uh, to be a part of the show because they actually have a voice in it uh, and have uh, put some of themselves within the work. Great. I think the, the 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 creative fires of Theater Outre um, and Club Didi also are are part of this. When you go to drag shows, a big it's it's not like seeing a play. It's it's you're inviting the audience to show appreciation and to enjoy themselves physically, emotionally, just to to be. And, and historically, queer people have downplayed themselves. Um, to be in a space. So drag shows invited that. And that space specifically that we had there was mandated to, mm -hmm. to celebrate that and to lift it up as high as we could. And so part of the Princess Show too and all, and all the things that we had collaborated on were about, like it, it is a queer story, but there's no, a lot of queer stories are about the struggle of queer people. This just had queer people that had no need to explain or or deal with any of that in this world. The, the real struggle was some kind of a universally you know, shared thing of self-acceptance. And so I think in a way too, the, the queer storytelling was about saying, first of all, enjoy this, physically enjoy this, you know, dance if you want to, um, but also see yourself in this, in a world that, where queerness isn't questioned or out of place or strange. Yeah, and if I can add, the, um, the one of the last times we did it in Halifax, we figured out that we really did want to have the audience standing up. Uh, and so we did it at, um, well, what was then the marquee. Uh, and, uh, and everyone was standing. There was a DJ that started off the, off the night, and then we did our show. And then we had a DJ afterwards. And so that it was actually a whole experience, and that it wasn't just come and sit down and read your program uh, and, and listen, uh, that they are very much there to celebrate themselves as well. Um, and the, now, I don't want to do the show any other way. Great. Thank you. Uh, I want to ask John uh, a question. You talked a little bit about in the sirens calling your use of materials, but also you talked about like the mirror or the mirrored surface um, and the ways in which, you know, historically, you know, the use of the mirror in terms of vanity, but the way these are positioned, it's reflecting very much back the city onto itself, right? The architecture, the sky, all of those elements. And so sirens calling is a, you know, it's a piece of public sculpture um, in downtown Halifax. And so I'm and you've talked also about the, the materials, you know, even that you've used that's referencing back into the very, you know, history or materials of the province itself. Um, and as you know, the waterfront, right, is going through this massive kind of reimagining. And so I'm wondering how you see Sirens Calling fitting into this wider discussion of really how the city and how the waterfront is kind of reflecting itself or, or this growing process that's happening. Well, I, I, for me, it, it, the mirror are the living part of it. Because the you know these figures are very stoic and they, but when the when you see the cloud blow or the rain in them, uh, and I, I I find the waterfront a bit like a circus, <laughs> and so I have with these figures standing above the circus, you can have some serious reflection even mm -hmm. no matter where you are, so it, it's about reflecting on your position in space with the desire to travel as well. So um, I think that, that encountering the world is a big part of it So you, in, for me. And at night, there's blue lights that, you, that are embedded in this. Technically, that was a nightmare to drill down six feet of 
solid granite and hope you get it in, in the right place. Uh, and there's blue lights that give this ethereal lighting at night. So, uh, and I think in you know a rain or a snowstorm, they would you know they that that living quality for me is very important uh, because you tend people tend to think of sculpture as static, but it's not because you have the ability to move. Uh, so if you circumnavigate these things, they're always changing and reflecting a different thing. Yet they have this. Uh, uh, be, yeah, they have a stillness. Behind everything, there is a stillness, and that I'm interested in that stillness, or the rightness of things. Uh, and you know when something is right because you know it feels right. Uh, and where's that feeling come from, and what does that mean? That's a big question. Uh, I was uh, my first place of uh, consciousness. I was born in Amherst and taken to Joggins. So Joggins was a big part of my beginning. And you couldn't have a fire on the beach because there was enough coal. You would set the beach on fire. You would have, and I remember finding uh, a sturgeon, and I thought I found a dinosaur because of the exoskeleton. Mm. Uh, so there was, a, you know, and you have the forever waves washing upon five million years. Uh, so those kind of, the poetry of that, or in, in Parsbro, where you see fossils of raindrops, uh, I think, you know, millions of years before humans existed. I find those very poetic things. Great. Thank you very much. Question? Yeah, no, I'm, it's <laughs> was poetically, no, I was like transcended for a moment. It was beautiful. Uh, I have uh, another question uh, for Alexander, but it's also talking a little bit also about Andrew Steve's um, involvement in it. And so I'm going to read um, kind of a quote when he was talking about his experience. And so he notes that when you're composing type in this way, physically rebuilding the story word by word, letter by letter, it was extraordinarily evident to me that nothing was out of place. The performance of the story was as tight as a poem. So my question for you is there seems to be so much admiration that each of you have for each other. Um, Andrew for you as a writer, um, you for, um, uh, um, and then you for Andrew as, as a booksetter, right? And so there's an exacting kind of almost perfection both in the production of the book as well as the language kind of that's used in the book. And so I'm wondering, you've talked a little bit about this already, but if you want to, if you could expand a little bit more about this, you know, how each kind of affects the experience, how the book has, has affected the experience of reading, um, you know, the text of Lagomorph, and how Lagomorph also ha has informed kind of e even the typesetting of the book. So, because to me, there's, there's quite a, like, a beautiful kind of poetry in, in that relationship um, for the creation of this. Well, I hate to bring you into this, but... Uh, uh -oh. But you know, you're, you are currently curating Andrew's um, wood type exhibition. All of you in cyberspace, go and see Andrew's uh, wood type. Um, because I think it hits exactly on what uh, John was talking about, about a pure stillness that is, that when you write something, like I, you know, I write things longhand with pencils, or I type them on screens, or I you know, jot a note to somebody, and and this sort of ephemeral quality of most of our utterances, which I'm furious about in texting, and like I just hate it. Uh, but when Andrew goes, and he takes with his hands, like every single letter, and he makes a sculpture, he casts it. So the last, the, the last line of this, uh, if you see the typeset, the last line of this story or a clause of it is, and the rest is everything else. Like, I just wrote that, and the rest is everything else as a kind of loop. But when he said it, and he gave it to me, he showed it to me, like the words in metal that he then pressed and we draw. I was so uh, moved by the immobility of it, I suppose, if that makes sense, like that, that and and he files it down, and we have videos of the two of us where he's just like scratching a paragraph that he, and then we set it and run the page. I think it's, like I said, uh, it's just immensely, it was immensely moving because I care so much about him. I really care about him. I care about his project, care about how he has made his life in art. 
And so it was a huge compliment, I suppose, to to see my words. And the woodcut, there's an amazing woodcut in there. Uh, very primal stuff, ancient, ancient stuff. Uh, and the story is kind of contemporary. The story is very much a, a story of the present. But when Andrew got a hold of it, it sort of became like a, like kind of what print is made for, I suppose. And uh, and uh, yeah, I was just so grateful. I was deeply grateful. That was my my number one experience of this whole thing has just been one of gratitude. Wonderful. Uh, so I'm going to ask one last question of each of you in the group, more of a kind of fun question or stressful. I suppose it depends on how one uh, interprets it. Uh, but if I was to walk into your creative space, what is one object or item that is so deeply ingrained in that space, like a must-have item in your studio for your creative process? What would it be? Okay, that's a great answer. Okay, so an espresso pot. Anyone else? Fabric. Fabric, okay. Probably with sequins on it. Most likely. Okay. <laughs> uh, I think often for me it's a, it's a piano or a keyboard, some, some kind of piano or keyboard, yeah. Okay. Neil or Alexander, if you don't have to answer if you don't want to. I don't really have a place. <laughs> I just can do it kind of airport lounge, sure. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, I kind of try to fit it in wherever I can. But so. is your process mainly kind of pen and paper in longhand, or is it a laptop, or like how, how, how do you typically get your words on the... I imagine for everybody here, you're thinking about it all the time. Mm -hmm. You're just thinking about it all the time. So then if a chance comes to go for it, you're like, I have to go for it now. I'm going to go for it right now. And so, but I understand for I understand for people working with physical medium, you can't like do it in the airport. But, uh, but uh, I have I have. <laughs> I, I can relate. I have too. Yeah, hmm. yeah. The laptop is a is a digital artist's, you know, hmm. thing. Also, we were talking today about how a futon. Uh, or a cot is necessary ah. because many of us have actually decided to just sleep, sleep in the, the theater, theater uh, because again you wake up and you want to be ready and, and ready to work and you're kind of in the mindset already and so you just don't leave that space. Mm. Well so the futon with the espresso pot. Definitely necessary. Right it's a combo. Uh, Neil what if, can you think of an, an item or an object that for you is really you know central in your studio space if I were to come into it? Really, Other than clay, um, <laughs> uh, it's it's really the clutter, and uh, you know maybe for my colleague to the to my right and 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 my colleagues to the left. Let's just I'll include everybody. It, it's also being reacquainted with all the things you've thought before. So I I don't know how you get that when you're as a writer. Maybe it's looking through notebooks. Uh, but that's what my studio is for me. So I, I remember going to see a lecture about post and, and the art theory theorist was talking about post studio, which to me is such bullshit. But because all those artists will go to somebody's studio, you know, they'll go somewhere or to some lounge airport or other to work, you, you have to be somewhere. And when I go in the studio, if I, it takes me back into familiar territory, I may reject it, but, but it's, it, it crowds in around me and sometimes it's not pleasant, you know, that you'll be around things that you don't want, that you want to see in your past. But on the other hand, I think having those reminders are as valid as, as those things that are undone or things that you can do again and you can go through these momentary renewals by looking at something, uh, be it a phrase or an object, and you can see it again differently now. And so having some of those things available I think is, is useful and that could be your memory. I can also, yeah, I can relate to this, this sense of seeing your previous work as proof that some things are even possible. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it is the same for your processes, but some all work, but some of it comes easy. 
But even the things that come easy, I find uh, there's at least some point in the middle where I um, c completely question my worthiness and wonder if I, you know, if anybody will hire me to do anything that's way easier, <laughs> because um, it's it's really difficult. But having sort of proof that you've you've come through it before and that you, like you said, you have this perspective on it now that you can see it for what it was, finally, when you're in the work. It's, it's there, but finally, with time and distance, you can see, it. oh, that, that's just a thing that I made. And do you think insecurity is a component in, in working? As an artist? <laughs> yeah, as part of what you and use. That sure is for me. Yes. <laughs> I think uh, most artists, I think all artists, actually, have super egos and low self-esteem. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> self-esteem, okay. But that's different than being insecure, the low self-esteem part. Well, yeah. Yeah, I get the big ego actually. part, yeah. but... <laughs> but but I think uh, this is the new metaphor for me, drilling six feet through granite. Mm. I'm gonna keep yeah. that to put a light in there. Mm. I'm gonna yeah, keep that yeah, uh, because, uh, because I think that all aesthetic challenges are in the end practical. Like in the end, yeah. The artist is just trying to find like a practical solution to an aesthetic problem. So you're like, and the medium is always resistant. Like I always say this to my students, language is a resistant medium, my friends. Uh, it doesn't say what you want it to say just because you want to say it, right? It, it doesn't work that way. And I've always envied you. <laughs> I've always envied people like, well, I actually have a block. Of, it's a real block. <laughs> or it's clay. Like it's, that's my problem. Whereas I'm like, yeah, this is not working. So I, I think that uh, the idea that, that we're working in resistant mediums, like the medium resists our desires. Uh, that's, a, that's a cool thing I've only thought by, by sitting up here. <laughs> Are you familiar with the development of the language in Korea, the printed language? Yes. That's a very interesting thing. It happened in one day. And the, yeah, well, how? Well, the Koreans had an oral language and they used Chinese characters for writing. Then the emperor wanted to give the people a visual language to correspond with the sound language. And it was a proclamation. You can still get those on the sidewalk in Korea, a copy of that where they compare the Chinese and the Korean. Yeah. But it, it came, it made sound visible. And, and I think that's a very, and print makes it historic. So would that be the same as the, as the language of the Inuit, uh, that it, or was that just made into a picture? I'm not that familiar with Inuit development yeah. of their language. You know, it's uh, you know when it became a visual yeah. thing. Yeah. So I'm not sure. It's interesting you say that because I've just uh, on the thing that I'm doing now, which is reading writers <laughs> um, as part of the research, I'm reading the Epic of Gilgamesh. So you you and your reference point is for your project and probably others is is, is looking at the, um, the the great epic poems in this case Ulysses you're talking about and Gilgamesh precedes that and it's uh, and why I'm looking at it is only for one reason it, they were made on clay paper, mm -hmm. tablets on paper and, and they've been found Take one tablet daily <laughs> yes right <laughs> oh that's why they're all broken <laughs> No, I uh, so I think we're going to have to wrap up this most lovely evening, but I want to circle back to something that, um, as kind of a wrap up that, that Alexander actually said, and he was talking about, um, you know, the project and also the artistic project of, you know, this is different than you thought it was. And I think the masterwork finalists this year, all of them very much kind of fit into that because they challenge our perceptions um, of medium, they challenge our perceptions uh, of space, of experience, of environment, and I think art in general, right, encourages us to do that, to um, push, our, push ourselves outside um, ourselves. So I want to thank so much uh, the finalists this evening. I also want to encourage everyone to please learn more about the finalists if you haven't um, already. You can visit the Masterworks website, but also support artists and creators in your communities. We all want to live in creative, engaged spaces, and we need to help those spaces flourish and foster. So I encourage everyone to take that uh, away with them this evening, but really such a wonderful, graceful thank you for people in the audience, but however many people are in the, I don't know, web sphere, 
uh, drinking warm tea, uh, and to all of us on stage, but really to the artists and the finalists, uh, the announcement of the winner um, will be happening uh, this probably December, I think. Uh, so yes, yeah, stay tuned. Uh, but again, thank you so much to all the lovely finalists this evening. So let's thank you. Thank, thank you them. too. Yeah. Thank you.